so let's get into this. Okay, we've been doing a series called Reigning in Life in Christ. Because we are in Christ, right? And he's king of kings and lord of lords. So we are in him. We move in him. We dwell in him. He dwells in us. So we've got to begin to look how and understand and train how to be led and how to live within the kingdom and the spirit. Say amen. Now, when you hear the word kingdom, I'm just kind of giving you a prelude. When you hear the word kingdom, it means dominion, jurisdiction, power, demonstration of influence. So, for example, in the book of Acts, it says, when they had prayed, the place was shaken, and fear came on all the people round about. In other words, God's influence and his jurisdiction started taking over. We found out that the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven that we're operating in is replacing the kingdom of darkness that Jesus destroyed over 2,000 years ago. Someone say amen. And even though he's there and he's, he's lying, he's making it sound like he has lost a, a battle, and he, he, he's so graphic and so visual... And it's so easy sometimes for him to con Christians because we don't know who we are. Sometimes we don't know who we're in. And religious, I believe that he's the author of all religion because religion, as Marxism says, is an opiate of the people. In other words, communism said that those poor religious people, they're just drugged with religion. And you know there's a truth in that? Because God doesn't want us to be religious. Say amen. amen. He wants us to do what? To have a relationship through his son, Jesus Christ. Say amen. Well, I have to turn around and read my paragraph. So we got it up there, guys. We're going to talk about the, the subtitle is the model of shepherd and pastor. Verse 19, 2 Timothy 2. It says, nevertheless, a solid foundation of God stands, having this seal. This is how you recognize it. The Lord knows those who are his. And let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Iniquity is one of, depart from practicing doing wrong. Verse 20, but in a great house, that's talking about the earth, there are not only vessels, human beings of gold, vessels of silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honor, some for dishonor. Therefore, because you know this, therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, from your sin, from your flesh, he will be a vessel for what? Honor. That's you. Sanctified. Now, see, my sanctified means set of Part specially for God. You're set apart specially for God and useful for the master. And then the last part says, prepared for every good work. In 2 Timothy, verse, down verse 22, it says, flee youthful lust. That means all me, 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 I got to have, I got to have, I got to buy every little thing, and I'm going to be happier, maybe, another. That's youthful lust, immaturity. Flee it, leave it. Flee youth, youthful lust. Pursue what? Being right with God. Pursue doing things right. Pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace with those who call on the name of the Lord out of a pure heart. Then finally, verse 24 and the servant of the Lord must not quarrel. You shouldn't be argumentative. Don't get into fighting because Satan feeds on that. Remember, God doesn't want his church fighting. Remember the words anathema. Don't touch God's property. And the servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all. How many people? All. Yeah, yeah. Even the hard ones. And able to teach and patient. Now, I tell you what, it's really hard to sit under a pastor Peggy, that cannot teach. And you'll see a lot of them out there, very young. Now, listen, I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to pick on anything. But why would we want to sit under a young pastor that hasn't been seasoned? 
We think that the youth is going to rub off on us. But you're going to find out that, that young people don't know as much as supposedly the older ones. Say amen? The elder in the spirit. Now, there's two kinds of elders. There's physical elders. Some of you are older than I am, so you're my elder. But then there's spiritual elders. I'm older than many of you spiritually, even though I'm younger of you physically. Are you with me? All right, so the thing we need to realize is that we need to battle ourselves and to live after God. All right, let's go to the scripture. Go with me. Uh, whoops, I'm in the wrong page there. Uh, okay. I want to make sure I got the right scripture. All right, here's some of the things we're going to cover. We got this scripture up here. We read 19 through 22 and 24, and you got that on there? Today, we're going to cover these four areas. I'm using my tablet, so it has been a week. All right, the chief, number one, the chief shepherd, Jesus. We need to get a good picture of what he is as a shepherd. Say amen. Number two, God's description of a shepherd. First, Jesus. Secondary, what a true pastor or shepherd should be like over a flock. Number three, we're going to study the authority of the office of a pastor or shepherd. And number four, thank God has written down. Thank you, guys. The heart and mannerisms of a pastor or shepherd. Okay? Let's go to number one. The chief shepherd. Who's that? Jesus. Amen. So John chapter 10, please. One through five. I'm reading from the New King James. So it says, most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold, but by the door, but climbs up some other way, the same is a thief and the robber. So here, let me help you. Who's the thief and the robber in the Bible? Satan is. Here's another thing you might not be aware of. His religion, not Christianity, not pure Judaism, but his religion of them is a casebo. So really, it says, coming into meeting God, you, how many here know you can't work hard enough to be saved? You can't see enough Hail Marys or Our Fathers to be saved, even though that's okay, I guess. You have to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior to be saved. Amen. So Jesus says, you have to come in through the sheepfold by the door. Who's the door of the sheep? Jesus is. But there's one other hidden truth here. One hidden truth that you and I know, this church knows, maybe others do. The only way that you can come in and die for humanity is you have to become a human. And here we have God, Jesus Christ, stripping his godness off and coming as a human being. He's still God by decree, but he came as a human. So he could be in all points tempted as you and I are, yet without sin. So he could run his course and pay the price and purchase the earth and humanity back. Say amen. So he that doesn't come in by the natural birth is a thief and a robber. We know that's Satan. Verse 2. But he who enters by the door that is the shepherd of the sheep. Jesus has to be born naturally because he's God, so he became a man. And the word became flesh. Verse 3, to him the doorkeeper, the Holy Spirit opens, and the sheep hear his voice. Now, folks, let me teach you this. Every human being, say every human being, has a listening device in them. That listening device will go off every time they hear God. Now, only a fool will deny that. Listen to me. A fool will deny that because they love their sin more than they love the relationship with God. We're talking about the world here. So even the people in the world still know there's a God. Romans chapter 1, read it sometime. So they are without excuse. So that's why you and I can be emboldened. We can get excited because every time you share Jesus in love, their little listener goes off. 
whether they accept that or not. It goes ding, 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 and they know what you're saying. If you're saying Jesus, and talk about Jesus in love, they know what you're saying is the truth, even though by pride they would probably deny it. Now, I see Christians doing silly things like this, Piggy. You say, are you blessed? And they'll say, I am blessed. Blah, 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 blah. Hey, listen, not for very long with an attitude like that. Your job is to be humble, and your job is to lift other people up higher than yourself. Say amen. So we, you know I wasn't referring to Peggy. She's not like that. Anyway, so let's go on and let's look at that. So chief shepherd, then it goes on verse 3. To him the Holy Spirit opens, the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice because they have that little thing. Those that really want God will be hearing his voice. And he calls his own sheep by what? See, he knows you by name, doesn't he? And he leads them out. Just a little shepherd information. You see, the sheep, gets you, the sheep get used to their shepherd. They, they understand his mannerisms. They understand his voice. They get used to his care. And then if anybody comes along and tries to pretend they're their shepherd, they'll recognize that's not the shepherd. Can you say amen? But see, if we have religion, we don't have a shepherd. We have a hireling system. And the system doesn't really love us. If the going gets tough, the system or the person that's hired usually will go back to where they came from. They'll just abandon the flock. This is not what you want. You want a pastor, a shepherd after God's own heart. Can you say amen? I believe you got one. I think I'm one of those. Keep praying for me. Amen. All right, so look what it says on further. Verse 4. And when he brings his own sheep out. Now listen. Out of what? First, we get brought out of darkness, don't we? Then, through a system of following Jesus, we constantly get brought out of ourself into light. Can you say amen? Because it doesn't take long for us to get out of darkness into light, but it takes a lot of the Egypt to get out of us, a lot of the world to get out of us to renew our mind. Say amen. Last, uh, last week in the Bible study, I left everybody with some ideas about how important it is to constantly control your thinking, not, not legalistically, but don't let it float out there somewhat, somewhere. All right. And when he goes before them, he calls his own sheep, and they follow him. Notice they follow him. We have a lot of goats out there. Don't get mad at me. They're not following Jesus. They're going where they want to, doing what they want to do, and they're all calling them, I'm following Jesus. They're doing good things. Don't get me wrong. But you know what? I want to do what God told me to do, and I want to do it well, and I want to do it good, and he will help me to do it. But I don't want to go do a whole bunch of Christian things if he never asked me to do it because I then could do them wrong or not so well. So you just don't do works for God. You pray about what works God arranges for you, so you do them well. Someone say amen. God's in, into excellence. I, I was telling some of the people that travel a lot with me, and we were going down to Oregon. I says, you know what? I don't do stupid well. I'm going to say it again. Pastor doesn't do stupid well. It's hard for me to, when you got somebody in the bank and count, count, can't count your cash, you got somebody in the kitchen that can't cook your food. I don't do stupid well. Now, don't get mad at me. You're kind of judging. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. Not at all. Because God doesn't want us to be ignorant or lack of information. And folks, I'm not talking about being passionate on those who are not smart. I'm talking about those that don't try in their life and they just act stupid. Can you say Amen. There's too many of those. They're not applying. They're not trying. They're just living. And that doesn't work. God needs us to be in motion for us to get the promotion. And then five, yet they by means won't follow a stranger. Remember, there's a lot of strangers' voices out there. Voices of new age, a lot of different heads of the devil, UFOs and Sasquatches. I studied it all. You want to know what they are? Come and see me. We'll talk about lunch. They're all part of a demon manifestation in the last days. 
Are they real? Yes, very real. Is the devil real? Yes, very real. But God says, don't mess with them. Come out from among them. Don't touch the unclean thing. And I will receive you and be a father to you. And you will be my people, saith the Lord. Amen. A couple of points under this first part. Church, the sheepfold here is the earth. Jesus had to come through the door, natural birth, into the earth. Amen. Point two, Jesus was born in the earth so he could become the doorway for humanity to go to heaven, accepting Jesus. But first, he must come through the door of the natural birth. All others that try to redeem human beings are all imposters. Even Judaism can't save somebody. Jews, the covenant, the Old Testament is a wonderful thing. It's perfect in its design. But it was never designed to save anybody. It was designed to convict people of their sin and to not trust in their own abilities, but to trust in God who reaches down for them. Say amen. And you look at it now, there's a whole bunch of people trying to be Jews. And yet when you accept Christ, that's as close to being a Jew as you can. If any man be Christ, he's Abraham's seed. Heirs according to the promise. So stop doing your outward fleshly mannerisms. Doesn't please God. Start doing your inward devotions and get closer to God. Say amen. Now, let's go on. Drop down to verse 7, John chapter 10. Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, I am the door of the sheep, all humanity. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers. That's the religious systems. There's some tremendous, weird religious, Jainism and Buddhism and Darwinism and all the isms, all religion. We have Jesus. Can you say amen? And then Jesus goes on. There were thief and robbers, but I am the door, verse 9. If anyone enters by me, gets accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, he will be saved and will go in and out. In and out of what? In and out of the Spirit. We've been learning how to stay in the spirit, walk in the spirit, but God wants us to be able to move in the spirit, and we have to live in the physical, but we need to be in the spirit more than in the physical, so we learn to come in and out and learn the rhythms and the flow of the Holy Spirit. Look at your neighbor and say, amen. We come in and out. It says, I am the door. He who enters by me shall be saved. Then the thief does not, verse 10, the thief, that's Satan, does not Come except to steal, to kill, and to destroy. That's his mission for to get rid of you. Hello? I have come that they might have life, and they might have it what? Now, folks, this is just for fun. Have you arrived yet? Isn't there some more abundant life for you to get? Amen. And who's going to get you there to get it? All you got to do is follow him. Listen to him, pray to him, I mean to God, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, but he's the one that takes you in. And spend some time and let him adjust you. I'm going to tell you this, it's kind of hard to accept for the moment, but our growth and the ability to grow depends on how fast we surrender. Listen, listen. Our growth, all of us, depending on, doesn't matter who we are, our growth will either stagnate or, or pick up or even speed up depending on how much we surrender. Say, I got it. Now, there are a lot of Christians out there that it's only, now I gotta, I'm got i going to make some fun, so don't get mad at me, only surrender when they're caught, when they get in trouble. Well, all of us get in trouble every day a little bit. We mess up a little bit. That's not what God wants you to realize. He wants... He wants you to realize that as long as you are making choices for God, your growth is going to be very, very slow. As long as you're so busy and everything not to listen to God, we might miss some opportunities to really develop in some areas. Can you agree with that? So what we need to do is slow down, meet with God, and get his rhythm for every day and let him unveil these things. Listen, there are times you're going to feel like you need to hurry up, get some things done. That's never God. Never got. If you're feeling that, that's just the enemy trying to get you to miss a blessing. 
God's not in a hurry. Let me sing this song. I'm in a hurry to get things done. Oh, I rush and rush until life's no fun. All I really got to do is serve my Lord and, but I'm in a hurry and out of one accord. You know, we're, we're always trying to get things, always accomplishing, but you got to find that smooth rhythm so God can make you whole again. God can make us complete again. Say amen. Second point, God's description of a bishop or a shepherd. First, I'd like for you to go to Jeremiah chapter 3, look at verse 15. Now, we know Jesus is the perfect shepherd. We know to model our life. As a pastor, and under, I'm called an under-shepherd. My job is to model after Jesus, how he speaks, how he talks, to love the way he walks, and I know I can't do it without him. So he helps me to become who I am. So Jeremiah 3.15, and I will give you shepherds or pastors according to my own heart who will feed you with knowledge and understanding. Can I stop for a minute? Have I been able to do that? Okay. Whew. <laughs> All right, go with me to 1 Timothy chapter 3. Let's look at from a different point of view. 1 Timothy 3 verse 1. Now, a bishop is an overseer. Overseer is something. You could be a Sunday school attendant. You oversee Sunday school. You could oversee ushers. You could oversee certain things. But also, pastors oversees congregations. You understand? So, this is a faithful saying, verse 1. If a man desires the office or position of a bishop, overseer, he desires what work? Aha, good work. Two, a bishop then must be blameless. Don't run around picking faults. Don't run around causing problems. The husband of one wife. Now, see, I've been divorced, so let me straighten it up. It actually says in the, in the Greek, but one wife. Because back then, several pastors ran around, had many wives. One wife. And I make a joke at it. One wife at a time. One wife, be loyal, be faithful, because if you can't do that, how can you lead the church of God? Also, be cautious of those single men or single women leading congregations, because if they don't have a good group around them, they're very subject to deception. Hello? They need to have some accountability. Still with me? Husband of but one wife, temperate. That means you're balanced. Sober-minded, you don't fly off the handle. Of good behavior, hello? Hospitable, ah, I can't stand them people, I just preach to them every Sunday, just, I'm sorry. Hospitable, able to teach, boy, there you go. Not given to wine, do you understand? God doesn't want his ministers drinking. And you say, well, why? Let me give you a scenario. Let's say a little wine for the stomach's sake. It's all right, right? Well, let's say you went and you tossed down a bottle and a half of wine, having a good time for God. Now, I know you, hold on to me. But you really love God, but you, you, you overdid a little bit. Next thing you know, your phone rings and somebody says, I need you to come. I'm in the hospital. Come visit me now. Old <laughs> dumb old. Remember, we don't do stupid very well. A pastor or a leader that's overseeing is not to be drinking. Why? Because you're overseeing people. And if they smell it on your breath and smell it on you, that gives them a right to drink too. Now listen, I'm not against you doing what you have con no conviction. God doesn't convict you about having a little slip. I'm not going to convict you either. I have no condemnation coming from me. But there'll become a time when God will say, quit drinking, quit doing this, quit doing that. If it's affecting you spiritually, say amen. But I'm not condoning any of that. Just do things all in moderation. And happy is the man that never condemns himself and that which he allows. So somebody in Germany might allow five cases of beer and still I can love Jesus. 
But that's them over there. If you know someone that can't even get near alcohol without falling apart, then they shouldn't be around it. So people that are in charge of things shouldn't be wine-bibbing around. Can you say amen? That's why another reason we know Jesus never drank wine. Because he had to fulfill all scripture. Not given to wine. Not violent. Can you imagine a minister being violent? Not greedy for money. Hey, you guys. Thank you. I love my new Rolls Royce. Let me tell you something about ministers, okay? I believe, this is my conviction, a pastor should never live above the means of his people. In other words, I shouldn't have a mansion and you guys live in a cabin. I should live in a cabin too. Because I should never put myself or promote myself above you, nor should I ever speak down to you or ever speak as if you are you and I am me. Those things are not good pastor uh, things. Amen. So a pastor needs to not live above his people, causes people to feel like they're slaves, but to live in harmony with them. Remember I told you about pastors? Everybody else can hit and run, be the evangelism, shoot off somewhere, Mike, but the pastor gets to stay with the family and love all of you. Amen. Be good to your pastor. No. <laughs> Am I making any sense to you, right? But look what it says. Then it says, not greedy for money, but gentle, not quarrelsome. You know, husbands and wife, they argue. Lynn and I do not argue. We actually have intense fellowship, but we don't hold on. We do, you guys see us. We have a little bit of rebuttal, but there's not anything screaming or yelling. She hasn't thrown a football at me lately. Are you right there? Very good. Amen. So, then it says in verse 5, For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, that means a new beginner. That's why you don't want young pastors. You want seasoned pastors. You want to make sure they're seasoned. They've been through hell and back at least a couple of times. Why? Because they're not going to bail on you. You see, when you go to a church and you give and you support it and you support it, and suddenly the pastor looks at you and says, look, you're more than I can handle. I'm bailing on you. That's not a real pastor. That's a hireling. Their heart wasn't with the pastor. Listen, whether you come or not, I'm going to be here preaching the word. I'm obeying God, and I'm doing what he said, and also loving you the way he asked me to love you. Hello. And if I do that, I know I'm going to be blessed. Hello. That doesn't mean I don't get challenged, but that means I'll be blessed even in the challenge. Amen. And then listen, for a man does not know how to rule his own house well, how will he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest he be puffed up in pride, and he fall into a different condemnations as of the devil. Moreover, he must be of good testimony. Hey, that pastor does a street bar on my lawnmower, and then he left town. Actually happened in South Prairie. <laughs> what happened to the pastor? He took everybody's stuff and left town in the middle of the night. Hello. I'm moving right on. <laughs> it said, moreover, must have a good testimony among those who are outside, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Satan is doing his best to get accusations going on everybody. Don't you be involved once talking about God's property or attacking one of God's children. Whether you think they deserve it or not, everyone say amen. My first point under that point is church. The word says when somebody is in an office, they have a greater responsibility to maintain a good walk and be faithful to that office. Two, the bishop, the overseer, is an overseer of people, and he's accountable to them, or she is. Who must give an account of how he has treated them? So I have to answer for you how I treat you. Fifthly, the church, we want to season pastors. We want pastors that know what they're doing, know where they're going, know how to pray for you. C can you say amen? They don't scratch the head and says, I don't know. That's pretty scary. I went to a pastor one time, 
and I asked him a question. I said, can you tell me about this? And he says, you know, I, I don't know anything about it. Said, Didn't you go to college? He says, yes. He says, do you know anything about it? And I ripped it right off to him. And I says, that's it. And he says, I don't know. And so, of course, that was my last day at that church. Listen, don't sit under people that don't know what they're talking about. You can tell that what they're doing. They're trying to convince you to believe. Listen, whether you believe it or not, you know when you do the results. My job is to present the truth, encourage you to do it, and then pray for you to do it, and watch the results happen. You are seed, and you be Christ, you're Abraham's seed. You're growing. Say amen. Okay, the second point is a bishop is an overseer of people. You don't love people, you're not a true pastor overseer. We must give an account how we treat them. Then finally, church three, we want to a seasoned pastor with a heart after God. Amen? Not perfect. Doesn't have to be perfect. But don't be a pastor judge either. You're not a fruit inspector. You're just a fruit observer. And if there's no fruit in my life, what are you doing sitting under me? If there's no fruit in so-and-so's life and the thing's all falling apart, what are you doing trying to believe for the last thing? People go in and get married thinking that getting married is going to solve their problems. It's not going to solve your problems. In fact, they'll throw you into the fire. There's two of you to deal with. See, you're with me. All right, point three. The authority of an office. How many know that there's an authority as an office of a pastor? Now remember, this is God's word. This isn't Pastor Kerry trying to convince you. Go with me to Ephesians chapter 4, look 11 through 13. Ephesians 4. And it says, And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. See, a pastor has to be a teacher. For, the, for what? For the equipping, giving you equipment and showing how to use it of the saints for the work of the ministry. For the building up, edification means building up of the body of Christ. Till we all come into the unity, you see. God wants us in agreement Praying in revival, getting out of here. Say amen, winning souls, touching lives, instead of fighting among ourselves. Till we all come into the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Say me, that's me. Now go with me to 1 Peter chapter 5, look at verse 1. It says, the elders who are among you, I exhort, now this is Peter. Peter is the apostle to the church at Jerusalem. And James is the pastor at the church. The elders who are among you, I exhort, who also am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. So are you. Shepherd the flock of God which is among you. Now listen, serving as what? I'm supposed to see how you're doing. I'm supposed to look into your walk and your life, make sure you're doing good. Serving as overseers, not by constraint, because somebody told me I better do it. Not by compulsion, not, but willing, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly. You know, I look forward to be with you every Sunday. I look forward to pray for you every day. I look forward to those things. How does that happen, Pastor? God does. He's in me leading the way. Amen. And he says, nor as being lords over the entrusted to you, but being examples. How many know a good leader has to be an example to the flock? But being examples to the flock, and when the chief shepherd, that's Jesus, appears, you will receive a crown of glory that does not fade away. Good shepherds are hard to find, and we have a special reward for being faithful to taking care of you. Say amen. Now, in Hebrews chapter 13, 7 and 8 says, this is a sobering one, so please listen to it. Remember those who rule over you. What? 
Seems like in the day and age we live, the word rule seems a little harsh. But not really. Did you know I'm in authority over you? Now, I didn't put myself there. God did. But I have to really watch what I do. Hello? So if I'm authority over you, I may have made sure I take good care of you, right? But also, you're supposed to take really good care of me. And Linda and all that too, say amen, and the church of God. So we got that down. Remember those that rule over you and have spoken the word to you, whose faith follow, considering the outcome of their conduct. Why are they doing this? Why are you doing what you're doing? People call you names, Pastor Kerry. They blame everything on you. Why do you do it? You and Linda do what you do. Because we're in love with Jesus and we're obeying what God told us to do. And we're doing it with joy. Everyone say, with joy, Pastor Kerry. Do it with joy, Pastor Kerry. You'll get what I'm meaning in a second. Consider our outcome. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Okay, point one underneath that. Church, remember that the office is holy and the person in the office is human. He belongs also, she belongs to God. Each person that's in that office is to be respected. Hello? They're in a form of leadership. And they will suffer a stricter judgment if they mess up. So you don't have to criticize them. They're under stricter judgment by God. Two, God puts the people in the office as it pleases him. Gives them great responsibilities and then empowers us to fulfill them. That goes along with the office, if you're an apostle, a prophet, an evangelist. Point three. Today we'll see a lot of disrespect to those that are in offices. You don't blame me, go to YouTube. Pretty soon, once I get a little more famous, somebody will make up something on me. It's just the devil. And Jesus said this, I love this. Blessed are those that persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely. For great is your reward in heaven. Hey, persecute me. My rewards are mounting up. <laughs> it depends how you look at things, you see. So remember, church, the office is holy, but the person in the office is human. But they are to be respected, too. God puts the people in the office as it pleases him, gives them responsibility, and makes them have to be responsible. Then the authority goes along with it. Third, today we see a lot of disrespect to those who are of God, to those who hold God's offices. Don't you ever do it, okay? Just say, I won't. Somebody says, well, what do you think it's so-and-so? Just say, you know, bless them. Bless them and leave it at that. Get out of that subject and change the subject. Did you know if, if somebody asks you a question, that means you're in charge of the conversation then. Take the question, redirect it. Don't go on mishmouching things you shouldn't be talking about. Mismouthing. Sorry, mishmouth. <laughs> anyway, so are you with me? So point four, what does the word say about how to treat a shepherd or a bishop. Do you know? What does the Bible say how to treat me? How to treat Linda? So if you ever hear somebody in the church talking back at me or uh, being disrespectful, should you say something? Absolutely. So you don't ever talk to somebody in authority that way. Once they know that you don't like them doing that, they won't try to get away with it again. There are a lot of people will push things to the limit to see how much they can get away with. Don't you do that in God's ministries, okay? And I'm not going to push you and push you to your limit. I'm going to encourage you to be the best you can be. But I'm not going to control you. I'm going to guide you. That's my job, to guide you. God's job is to be in control of you because you surrender to him. Say amen. All right, let's go to our next point. Look at Hebrews 13, verse 17 through and 18. Listen to this one. This is sobering. Obey those that rule over you. Be submissive, for they watch out for your... 
Do you believe Pastor and Linda watch out how you're doing? Pray for you diligently? So please don't let anybody bad mouth the system that's working so well. Hello? Obey those that have rule over you. Be submissive one for another. They watch out for your souls as those that must give an account. You see, I have to account for you. Let them do so with joy and not with grief. For that would be unprofitable for you. You start giving me trouble, all I have to do is raise my hand and you're in big doo-doo. Thank God I don't do that. How many here remember Jesus' disciples, they were called the, thun, the sons of thunder? Do you know why they were called that? Because at one time, people were treating Jesus rude. So Peter, James, and John looked at Jesus and said, you want us to call fire down on them? To consume them? And Jesus turned to him and says, you don't know what spirit you're of. We don't do things out of anger and stuff. Are you, you see what I'm saying? But in the house of God, lots of respect for everybody. Say amen. Look at your neighbors. I have tremendous respect for you. Let them do so with joy, not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. Pray for us, for we are confident that we have a good conscience before you in all things desiring to live what? Honorably. I can honestly tell you, it's not been easy, but Linda and I are living one of the most fantastic lives. We're doing the will of God. What could be more fantastic than that? You see, I don't judge my life over the physical things that I have. I judge my life over the peace, the rest, the joy, the fruit of the Spirit. And yes, we have challenges, but it doesn't move me out of God. They just challenge us, and here's how I look at it. Remember, life's challenges are simply a stepping stone for you and Jesus to succeed. Say Amen. And finally, the heart and mannerisms of a pastor, our last point. Go with me to Titus chapter 1, 7, 8, and 9. You know I'm a bishop, don't you? I oversee a congregation. If you oversee a Sunday school, you're sort of a bishop overseer. We call him a straw boss. Supervisor, hello in the worldly terms. Titus 1, for a bishop must be blameless. He can't be running around picking fights with everybody. As a steward of God, we have to give an answer, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, say everyone, say amen, not given to wine. See, there's that wine thing again. Now, he didn't say you can't have a little wine but I don't want to have a little wine. I don't. Somebody asked me this. Laugh with me. Okay, listen carefully. Somebody asked me years ago, Carrie, do you drink? I said, all I want. Well, and they look at me, they want to condemn me. It says, I just don't want. You see, people are so quick to judge you and so quick to jump in. Don't let people like that dictate how you walk. You'll be walking on eggshells. Look, whether I drink or not, it's none of your business, but I don't because God says not to. So I love to obey my father because many blessings come through obedience. Can you say amen? Besides, I went through a bout of drinking. You smell bad, you look bad, you hug the, the porcelain potty, you know, you do all kinds of crazy things you wouldn't normally do. That's why they call alcohol, listen to me, spirit. It's a spirit because it was made to invoke spirits. If you know anything about casting a spell, when you drink too much, you cast a spell and you bring down your ability to resist. So you end up waking up with some ugly chick or some ugly dude the next day. <laughs> you see, let me just paint some kind of ridiculous thing to you. Because alcohol invokes demon spirits. Smile up at me. Jesus was a Nazareth. He could not touch alcohol at all. It's against his covenant. Jesus had to fulfill all the covenant demands. So even though he sat in a bar, he led them all to God. Hello? 
I heard a terrible story. I'm going to share it with you. Some Christians, supposedly Christians, I believe they were, because Christians need to be cleaned up too. We're up camping, and this one guy was going through a divorce thinking about suicide. And, of course, these Christians had beer, and they were smoking pot, and they were partying all around. And they saw that this man was depressed, so one of the bolder ones came right over. This is a true story. Walked right over and says, look, we know you're going through a hard time. We would just like to tell you, come over and party with us. Let's tell you about Jesus. What's wrong with that? And so the man just got sicker. And some friends of mine, those people moved off, and he was there. He was thinking of suicide still. These terrible Christians are the bad witness now. So you have to be balanced. You do, and they're supposed to care what people see in your life. And so these other people I know are fine Christians. They don't touch any of that stuff. They went over, and they noticed that he had a problem. And he said, we just came over to see if there was something we could do. And he says, are you like those other Christians? Drinking and partying and telling me that Jesus can fix my problem and I can see they have worse problems than me? You see, our testimony and the way we live before others is very important because what you do speaks far more than what you say. Amen? So that's not, I'm not pointing it out to you. Just don't be a compromiser Christian. Because they never end up doing much of anything but just surviving. I see them bobbling their head just above water, trying to maintain, yet they want to live their own life. No, 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 no. God's got something better. Can you say amen? So it goes on. Not quick-tempered, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but hospitable, a lover of what is good, sober-minded, just, holy self-controlled, you don't look like a big blimp, okay? Holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught that he may be able by sound teaching, doctrine is teaching, sound doctrine, both to exhort, convict those that are contradicting the word. Now, folks, when I say overweight, listen, it is not good to be overweight because it shortens your life. You don't have to be overweight. Don't plan on being overweight. And, and don't take any condemnation because there's only one person makes us overweight. We do. Oh, I got big bones, Pastor Kerry. I was told that lie too. Big bones can become smaller if you don't eat so much. So take it to heart that you need to have some self-control in everything or Satan will kill you with it. He'll kill you with your diet. He'll kill you with your diabetes. He'll kill you with this, kill you with that. When I, when I walk, and I, you know, they call me diabetic. I've lost enough. But when I walk, you know what my blood sugars are averaging? 100. And I don't take any insulin. Why? Because I worked on it, started working on my diet, getting that where I needed to be. Listen, if you really are, want to place your life in God's hands, don't give him a sack of garbage. But he'll still take you and he'll change you. But listen to him. Listen to him. Because none of where you are right now is where you're going to remain if you listen to him. He'll change us all, make us all better every day. Say amen. You'll look back for a month from now if you keep proceeding forward. And you'll go, wow, I've changed in a month. That's what God wants. We don't have long. You have to get after it. All right, say Amen. All right, so, so notice it's not self will not holy, set apart, self-controlled, holding fast the faithful word which has been, you have been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort, convict, and to those that encounter dick. In 2 Timothy 4, verse 1, he says, I charge you, this is Paul writing to Timothy, therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead, at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. What do we need to preach, everybody? Be ready in season. Anytime, be ready to share. And out of season, convince. Hey, you really need to be saved. How do I know? Because your life is a mess. Convince, rebuke, 
Somebody's trying to force something down you. You say, I rebuke that in Jesus' name. You have more power. I'll tell you one thing that happened. I had a guy that was coming at me, coming running right down the altar, and a whole congregation of people ready to give me a blow. And I just said, in Jesus' name like that, he flew back and slid down the aisle. That's a rebuke. It's a holy rebuke. That's just start yelling at him, telling him off. That's rebuking the spirit behind that stuff. Hello, someone say amen. It's kind of fun to see somebody fly through the air. And you could do it. Don't let the enemy box you in. Remember who's in you. All right, are you with me? Amen. And he said, well, judge the living and the dead. Preach the word, be ready in season, out of season, convince, rebuke, exhort. Look, let's get closer to God. With all long-suffering teaching, for the time will come, listen, this is the time now, when they won't endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itchy ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers that only tell them what they like to hear. And they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you, say me, but you be watchful in all things. Endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. Tell everybody about Jesus. Fulfill your ministry. Here's a couple of points and we'll finish. Number one, church, we should be able to recognize a tree by its fruit. Not by the works they do or the degrees that they have, Dr. Fahrenheit. But by the fruit, the love, joy, peace, long sufferings in their life. The self-control. Two, those who are called to an office must have what it takes for that office, including the fruit and the qualifications to use the equipment. Say amen. Thirdly, there are many in the office that should be selling cars instead. Because they're really not very good. And they should just step down and the congregation should pray for ministers to get in there that will teach them with the word and give them understanding just like we first heard. Say amen. Thirdly, there are many offices that should be, um, uh, be filled with faithful and wonderfully anointed pastors, but they're not. They must love God. They must love people. A pastor and overseer must be willing to go to the hospital, must be willing to lay down his life for his friends. Hello? I remember a pastor one time, I used to make fun of him. He'd come in like Hollywood and he'd have his two bodyguards. Or two bodyguards. He, he mosey in after the song service was sung as a star, and he was a good preacher. And he'd come up and preach, and he had all the right hair and all the right moves. Seems like I'm going to rank him down. But then after the church, after the service, people wanted to go talk to him and, and ask him questions. He would just take his two bodyguards, get in his car, and they would just usher him off. Nobody even knew where he lived. Now, that's just not what a pastor is. Evangelist, an apostle, maybe. But a pastor has to be with the people. You should be able to call me. You should be able to ask me questions. Amen? Now, let me ask you, did you get something out of this? This kind of message is really hard for me to preach because it's about me <laughs> or my office. But let's give the Lord praise, will you?